All right, hey there, welcome to my home office. So again, this is from a client and his mom from Egypt. This is some hieroglyphics that spell Michael, which is pretty cool. And then here is something about the date I was born, birth date, the bull, Taurus. Um, my physics books logic books, history of math books, and others behind there. So, and yeah, there are other books I've actually read. See, it's not just a haul. I'm not just pretending. I'm not a pretender, man. Geometry, more physics, chemistry, biology, algebra stuff. So, statistics. All right. So it's not empty back there. Um, okay, physics. So, some more detail about Galileo, and then this allows some people who weren't in class one day or other to make sure they understand. Then we can rewatch, take notes, stuff like that, get help from someone else um, if we have a different language or whatever. So, Galileo, what did Galileo do? We want to see this. So, this is important for different reasons. We're doing our physics, yes, but one other thing we get out of this is seeing how to do an IA later, a science IA, science internal assessment, where you got to come up with some problem you want to study and you got to look up the historical background of it, which is what we're doing, or about to do, and what we've done in class some. You got to look up the historical background. You got to have some question you want to get into, some inquiry. You got to do experiments, write up a report. So this would be like part of it looking at the historical background of something. Um, but more importantly, what we're doing is getting equations of motion. And the equations of a projectile motion. And seeing where it comes from, proving that it's correct, looking at experience and getting caught some concepts to build up to this instead of just taking it out of nowhere as if it's true. Please do not train yourself through years of schooling to just accept some idea, whatever. We want to be rigorous about our thinking and make sure we're rooted in reality. Make sure we know the truth, please. Um, we need more of that in human history. But we're looking at what the experiments were. Is the stuff legit? What prior concepts do we need to get to this? What prior generalizations do we need? Um, to know about our equations of motion and stuff like that, this is what basically what Galileo and Newton did, and then people developed from there. And we're gonna get in more into this. We'll get into forces and Newton's laws and work and energy and these other higher, more abstract concepts. Um, you know, for example, energy, the concept of energy helps us connect different parts of physics so we can go from one to the other and we can have modern technology and modern science. We need these concepts, these ideas about the world to help us go back and forth. Like we can go from mo moving water in motion to a changing magnetic field to electricity, to heat, stuff like that. The concept of energy helps us go from one to the other, but that's more abstract. We've got to get this down. We've got to get our velocity and acceleration and stuff. So um, we got a lot of this pretty well. We need to work on it a little bit more, but this one part we're gonna address and hit, make sure you got this down is, you know, how Galileo helped us in all this. Um, now, one thing, he, some things he did were he discovered the moons of Saturn. Was it Saturn? Makes sense. Let me see. Jupiter. Okay. Um, he discovered the moons of Jupiter, which is a genius, like, observation on his part to look at some part of the sky and then look there the next day and remember 
what was there amidst all these stars and see a change and start looking there and marking down what he saw, diagramming it and getting the, the stars. But that's a whole thing in itself, talking about astronomy and all that. Um, he calculated the height of some mountains on the moon. He observed for the first time with a telescope. He heard about a telescope, made one himself. It was more powerful than the one he had heard about that had been designed by someone else in Europe. Instead of looking at just things on the earth, he turned into the sky, looked at, up at the heavens and saw the moon wasn't smooth as some people thought, but was rough. He saw that there were stars, like stars in the sky that would change places other than just the planets. Um, so he helped revolutionize what humans knew about the heavens and astronomy. And he helped figure out basics of motion. He started the science of materials. So those are some things that he did also that are good to know. Um, as I said, his father was one of the ones who studied Greek drama and tragedy. And in that, they, people sing. And he learned, the father learned, like helped develop um, European opera from that. Um, he was influential. So Eric Galileo knew about music from that. He was, you know, I don't know, amateur, really good, I don't know, musician. Um, played some instruments, knew about singing, and that helped him in doing the physics he did. But, um, so okay, you know, so of course, one thing on this, as I said earlier, take some notes. We have the video, we can watch this, you can watch it over, you can pause, rewind, take notes, pause, take some notes, start again, rewind, so on. Um, and then we'll know, we'll have it recorded right here about Galileo. So, as you said, astronomy, moons of Jupiter, height of the mountains on the moon, the moon um, is rough. He also discovered that, I think it's um, Venus has phases like the moon, like full, half and all that, whereas other planets don't, some other things. but. In this, as we're talking about, um, he did some basic experiments. He went back and forth between several things. He studied, um, again, to get to this stuff, like, you know, where does this come from? What concepts does this depend on? How do we know it's true? That's what we're doing here. And this will help us figure out if things are true in other areas. Get us ready for the IA, if we do one. So, Galileo. Um, so things he did, and what we've studied so far, equations of motion, projectiles, he went back and forth between studying free fall, You know, when something just falls, you let it go and it falls freely. Um, pulled down by gravity. With that, and he studied pendulums. Inclined planes. You can write plane also. I do not have the room. Well, I guess I'll write it over here, but... Free fall and pendulums and climbed planes. He studied each of those and went back and forth. Okay. Um, it was thought that when something fell, some different people had different ideas, but one thing that came to him was that the fall would depend on weight, which kind of makes sense. Like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It seems like things that are heavier or harder to push. So why couldn't it be the case with like falling too? You get something heavy and like, but that'd be a little different because it'd be harder to throw. So never mind. That's not a good idea. But mm, if it was heavier, it'd be pulled down faster. If it was lighter, it'd be pulled down lighter. And I think it might, might've come from doing some experiments in like syrup, molasses, treacle, as I've said. I think he, if he put some stuff in there, I think if it's heavier, it'd fall. I forget. I gotta actually do that. Um, 
so much to do, so little time. But, um, you know, like, why do mule ears have such big ears? Why are there so many gulls in Idaho, in Boise? Why are they here? You know? Um, how deep is the hot spring river that goes under like warm springs in Boise? How much does it warm up the rock under Boise? Like, where does it come from? Is it connected to Yellowstone? You know, so much to do, so little time. But um, people thought that things would fall according to their weight. And so he showed they didn't, as we've discussed. Um, if you get some things, like he did, with his famous Leaning Tower of Pisa experiment. He went up to some height, dropped some things, one heavier, one lighter. They fell and they hit the ground at about the same time as we've experimented in class and showed with like a board and a pencil and stuff. They hit the ground at the same time. You know, maybe I released them a little bit, but you saw essentially the same. Whereas people thought that if something weighed 100, it would fall twice as fast as something that weighed 50. And because of some poor, wrong ideas about TOK, about how we know, people didn't do the experiment. Or even if they saw something, they wouldn't connect it to what they know or take it seriously. Okay? So that's an important issue, too. Um, to do this, why did Galileo do this stuff it seems so obvious when no one else did before because of TOK, okay? Galileo did these things to be aware of. He studied free fall, when something falls. A pendulum, when it, something swings back and forth. You know, like a pendulum. Um, pendulum. You are getting sleepy, very, very sleepy. Okay, maybe not. Free fall. Um, an inclined plane. Okay, that didn't work. Never mind. Um, but you know, inclined plane. Okay. Um, so he studied those things back and forth. One helped him understand the other. This helped him understand this, which helped him understand that, and back and forth. But again, why? Because people were influenced by Plato. Whereas Galileo followed Aristotelian premises. Um, and I can give you some quotes for that. I'll put some in class notes or the link to this video or something. Um, some Platonic stuff versus some Aristotelian stuff. And um, some we've already talked about, but Plato. Okay, Aristotle was a student of Plato. Plato was a genius. We should study him. He invented philosophy. Other people had had wisdom around the world they dealt with some issues. You know, we got wise people for millennia around the world, but Plato was the first one to like put it together systematically, so far as I'm aware. Um, look at what the world is like, what kind of world we live in, how do we know it? So the world we live in is like metaphysics. What's the nature of this world? Can we know it? Or is it like something we can't know because of like probabilities and some like errors some people make in claiming stuff about quantum mechanics. Um, you know, they get this philosophy and they apply it to their physics and turn around and say the physics proves it. That's like invalid. Um, if you know the history of philosophy, then you know their game. Some people in modern physics claim, oh, it's all probability, we can't really know anything. Well, how do you know that we can't know anything? That's a contradiction. If you know, we can't know anything, you know something, and so there's something you know about the world, so deal with it. But um, Plato was a genius. He asked a lot of good questions. We should study him, but he was wrong on a lot of things. Aristotle, 
was the student of Plato, got a lot of stuff correct. So they were both great, but he was correct and he was wrong. Um, and of course, like every human being, Aristotle was wrong on some things, like who isn't? Um, some people like to like get all gleeful and jump over Aristotle and say he's wrong about certain things when you know they need to look in the mirror. Um, we're all wrong about some things, so deal with it. But um, you know, be appreciative, be reasonable, be real, be honest, be true, please. Um, appreciate people for what they can do, no more, no less. Know who they are. And, it, you know, we shouldn't go, like, bad-mouthing or being prejudicial or trying to railroad someone about something. You know, of course, railroading means, like, you force them into a position and try to pretend they're something that they're not. But Plato, um, to get this straight, in his doctrine, um, experience was invalid. as a means of knowledge. So, as a means of knowledge, experience was invalid. I mean, in that sense, it was an illusion. Illusory, invalid. Illusory, I'll, I'll write that a little better. Misleading. And so Plato was one that said this. Concepts Concepts had nothing to do with experience. Concepts, abstractions, generalizations. So you might want to write that down too. Concepts, abstractions, generalizations. Concepts, abstractions, generalizations. Had nothing to do with experience. Okay? So to do science, to know what's true, you cannot focus on or learn from experience. You have to turn away from it. You turn away from what Plato would think are lies. Notice that's not what, as we said, that's not what Galileo did. Galileo did not do this. Gal Newton did not do this. Maria Montessori, the great educator who came up with Montessori education, she did not do this. The dog whisperer did not do this. Mary Curie did not do this. Ibn al-Haytham did not do this. Okay? Um, some people who would do this, like someone who argued with Air Galileo about how many planets there were, and I'll put a quote up. I've mentioned this before. This guy said, being lost in math and lost in this stuff, this, so he, these people try to tell the world as it is, the world how it is. Instead of being like Galileo, the world tells us what the truth is. They say, we're going to tell the world how it is. We tell you what to do. So for someone who was like Platonic said, there can't be nine planets. There are seven holes in the head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven days in the week. There's seven of this and seven of that. So there has to be seven planets. How could there not be seven? I mean, talk about ignoring experience and like making junk up in your head and trying to tell reality how it is. That's platonic. Galileo says the truth about how many planets is determined by how many planets there are, not 
airy fairy little make believe stuff about stuff. Okay, so that's Plato. Aristotle. In contrast, said that conceptual knowledge, concepts, come from experience, experience is valid. And of course, I mean in terms of knowledge and stuff, if you want to write that down in parentheses or as an addition, experience is valid. It's a valid source of knowledge. It is the fundamental unquestioned source of knowledge. In fact, looking at how geometric proofs are done, got Aristotle with that, and abstracting from other things, discovered logic, developed the field. Because he's the one that finally gave us a standard for what is true. And he identified elements of an argument, how to deduce what are things that are called the syllogism. Um, The basic units of like deductive thought or argument syllogism, like L O G and S Y L for together, like sim, sim, speaking together, L O G, like logic, speech, um, thought when you put some thoughts together in a basic unit, syllogism. Um, and just like in a geometric proof, you can't do anything unless you have a diagram and a starting point. You get a diagram and a starting point, and then you can go step by step to prove things. Only then, well, unlike us, he was a genius. I mean, unless some of you are geniuses, but I'm not. But um, he saw that all knowledge is like a geometric proof. It has a starting point, and that's experience. That's where we start forming concepts or reasoning from, just like in a geometric proof. So that's where we, bam, get logic. And that's what, when Galileo and Newton put that into play and saw that what it means practically and really developed that idea more than even Aristotle had done, then we got modern science. Until then, it wasn't going anywhere. And people were doing silly things like seven holes in the head, seven days in the week, therefore seven planets, you know? That's not going to build science. That's like nonsensical and like little cray-cray. But now, putting that into play, bam, we have science. Experience is valid. Um, concepts come out of experience. Okay. So, Aristotle, not Plato, is the one that said, do experiments. That's where Galileo would get the idea. If experience doesn't matter, we turn away from it, do stuff in our head, and talk about sevens, but if, if experience does matter, that's where we look. That's our source of knowledge about physics and everything. So that's Aristotle, okay? Um, and I'll put quotes in there if you could see, as I said, that Aristotle, Galileo followed Aristotle. And he actually taught some of the logical works of Aristotle at the University of Pisa, I think it is. Galileo was a college professor. He taught at a college in like, you know, way back in the 1500s. 
1600s. Um, he taught Aristotle. He knew Aristotle in and out. And so when some people tried to argue with him about whether things in the heavens change or not, he pointed out that in saying things change, I contradict the doctrine of Aristotle less than you who say, because, well, I contradict the doctrine less than you because Aristotle said the most important thing is that all knowledge should be placed second to direct experience. Experience comes first, conceptual knowledge comes second. Conceptual knowledge must conform to experience. It must be placed second to it. First, experience. Second, conceptual knowledge. He said that in a quote, and they can put it up. Um, so, Plato and Aristotle. Okay? That's how they influenced him. And because he dug into him, he was able to revolutionize science at root to get it be done correctly finally. Okay. Now, got that clear. So, um, so now he's doing things. Again, some people are reading what ancient Greeks say. Oh, like the heavier something is, the faster it falls. So it's written down, so it must be true. Um, Galileo is like, nope. Um, authority is not the standard of truth. The source of our, our knowledge is not authority. The source of our knowledge is experience. Authority is to bow down to experience, not vice versa. So he's figuring things out on his own. He knows experience is valid and we can experiment. So he tests some stuff out. He sees by his experiment with the Leaning Tower of Pisa and other things that things fall in this context at the same rate. One doesn't go at a much greater velocity than another. Um, so he studied free fall and to figure out how fast things fell to help improve that they actually do fall at the same rate. If we can calculate that number, then we know. We can see it, but if we can go from experience and we see that it's true and we can put it into words, and then if we can get it even more abstractly into math, then we can work with it more. And Newton makes much more of that because while Galileo did some stuff with math, which is good, and gave people the idea to do it and showed them how. That's another thing about Galileo. Make, please know that. He showed how we can use math to study cause and effect and the nature of things. Very important. Um, so Galileo
to figure out what is it and what does it do? What is it and why does this happen? Cause and effect, okay? My hand causes the marker to change direction, right? The marker would fall, my hand hits it, it changes direction. Um, cause and effect. No more black markers, I need to pick these up. Um, that's important. Then Newton was able to get that, and he was able to show that with math, we couldn't do this otherwise. You can't look and see, oh, the moon and my falling marker are the same. No one does that. But we can prove, we go from experience to words to math to prove something, then we know that the moon is falling at the same rate as the marker, but lessened by how far away it is. Because they already knew from what the ancient Greeks did that the moon was like 60 times further from the center of the earth as like we are here. And so, since gravitation is less, the further are you, away you are from something, he was able to show that if you get mm, like the um, like the pull, the fall, you get the acceleration of the marker and the moon being a 60th of the distance away, it'd be like a 60th squared of the acceleration, if I remember correctly. Um, that's what it would feel. Um, I have to look at my notes to make sure this is right, but I think I'm remember remembering correctly. But um, how fast the marker falls versus how fast the moon is falling, it's in proportion to how far away something is, the square of that. And that takes math. And don't worry if you don't understand that. That's like later stuff. That's just to illustrate the math idea. Um, but that's one thing he did. And that allowed him to do this here. So he studied free fall. And as I say, using math, he figured out what it was. Things fall at the same rate, as you said. What is that rate? How can we use that? How much is, if we have clocks and we want to do stuff like more accurately and all that, what's the pull on something when it's going down, pulling a rope to make the like clock turn? Um, how much weight makes how much pull and all that stuff? We could try to make it a science instead of the art that it was at the time. So. He would study pendulums and inclined planes to slow down the motion. If something's falling, it's going fast, but if it's an inclined plane, then it's not gonna be, especially if it's like this, then the object doesn't roll as fast as we've seen in class. And you can try yourself, roll something down a shallow slope versus drop something. And this one um, will have less like acceleration. But, um, and you can study a pendulum too. And that's what he did because the pendulum is also in free fall. You put something out and what does it do? It falls. It's like a constrained fall. Um, like, you know, we get this and we drop it and then it goes to here and continues on. But it's like fall, fall. So it's up here and it's a constrained fall. So if we study this fall, we can learn something about free fall. Or if we study how something rolls down an inclined plane, we can see how it falls. You know, because we know the more the angle, the more like free fall. When the angle goes down, there's less it's less like free fall until it's horizontal. Okay. So make sure you took notes on that stuff, please. Um, now, 
the pendulum, you know, the thingy that swings back and forth. Free fall, something just falls down, going towards the surface. Inclined plane, something rolling down or sliding. Um, and it turned out that when he would figure out a pendulum and how it moved back and forth, he figured out that um, length, look at my notes, make sure I am remembering correctly. Length is four fifths t squared, it should be because time squared. And um, we got, let me scroll down in my notes here to where I have this stuff. Do, 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 do. And then we'll get some data. Um, almost there, almost there. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Here it comes. There, okay. So, yeah, 450 squared, right? Of course, free fall. Um, how is height related to time? And then inclined plane, we have h equals at squared. Where a depended upon the angle. A is for acceleration. L is for length of pendulum, T is for time. So, uh, like from here to here, L, T is for time, H is height. For H is height, the height of the ball to the ground. Okay. So, you can say h equals height, l is length of pendulum, t equals time. Here, time of fall. How long does it take to fall? Here, time of fall. How long does it take to go down? Here, it's the time to swing back and forth, a complete period. Like, the Earth has a period of one year, 365 days, where the daylight is about 24 hours. It's like how long it takes something to complete. So to go over and back, that's what T would be here. The time it takes to swing over and come back to the same point. Okay, so these are the things he figured out. He could use this to measure that, this to measure that, and once he figured this out, now people could use pendulums to measure time for the first time ever. Um, first he had to use his heartbeat. Imagine trying to do things with your heartbeat at first, and then he used like sand clocks and water clocks. He'd measure the weight of water, he'd let water go out, and that would represent how much time something was. And he still used that for this, but he could use these. So he combined them because he noticed that when this goes over and back, that would be like, like a pendulum going here and back would be like an inclined plane and another one with some little smooth curvy transition here so there wouldn't be some like bump or jump and you could get a ball and if you rolled it 
here and back. That was like a pendulum. And he did that in his studies also. And notice how you got the T squared in all of them. Very important. And we're like, who the heck would have thought that something rolling down here was like this thing flipping back and forth or like something falling? First time ever in history. This is so amazing. You roll a ball down and that's like something swinging back and forth and that's like something falling. Like what the hell? <clears throat> it's like revolutionary. But notice with, again, as I say with math, we can know that. We see, we know it's the same form. We can grasp it and prove it, T-O-K. Whereas otherwise, um, some people could say, that's not the case. You think a pendulum is like something going down an inclined plane, you're crazy. But bam, take that, yo. It's true. So there's things Galileo did. That's what to know about. Free fall, pendulums, inclined planes. And he'd study one to do the other. He studied this and this because they're similar. Something going back and forth to the same height. The pendulum would swing about to the same height. And this would go up and back about to the same height. But notice with friction or resistance, they go about the same height without that. But when friction or resistance start to come into play, this won't go up as high. Just like this will not swing as far. So again, they're similar. It's about the same height at first, but then when friction comes into play, you know, it starts going down. So that'll maybe help you see it too. Um, and then of course, you know, you can, he would get this and this and measure them. And he tried to figure out, since he knew this, the length is proportional to the time squared. If you got a pendulum that you let hit a wall, so it's not the full period, and you rolled something down, he could see what length of pendulum he needed. And that would tell you about the time for a certain um, thing to get on here. So he'd get on an inclined plane, roll something down, and when it hit a board down here to make a noise, boom, bop, he would have a pendulum get one long enough so it hit the board bop, at the same time. So putting something here and holding a pendulum out, releasing them at the same time, to be bop, this would hit the wall. Same time this hit a board, put something here, roll, bop, get something here, let it go, bop, and the bot would be at the same time. Then you could know from this length what the time is and hence how long that took. Genius or what? So there's some things to put in your notes too. So think about that and write that down. Release a pendulum, let it go one fourth of its period. It would not be able to go over and back. You know, one, two, three, four. It would go only part of that. It would have to go over and back to be a whole period. But we're only letting it go one quarter of the way. One quarter, two quarter, three quarter, four quarter. One quarter of the way. Okay? So we'd let it swing, bop, roll something down, bop. The length, you know, can figure out the time, and you know what that time was. Okay? And it helps you see that if this is proportional to t squared, so is that. So write that down. And that helps you see how he went back and forth from one to the other. And these are the things you study. So there. There is what Galileo did and why. So we know what experiments did he do? What was the result of each one? What's the significance? How did Aristotle influence him? Aristotle versus Plato. So we've covered that. So we see that he studied free fall. He studied the pendulum. He studied the inclined plane. This, the significance was that now we have something to measure time, like grandfather clocks. You got clocks with the, with the pendulum that swings back and forth. Thank Galileo. Um, and that allowed people to measure heartbeat too. Finally, 
if they want to have a standard to measure someone's heartbeat, they can finally compare it to this. Very important medically. Um, and you learn, so you learn about pendulums or repetitive motion, and that helped us understand how electromagnetic radiation works and light and some other things, as you'll see in the future of physics. And he learned about how things roll down here, and it allowed him to figure out how fast things fall for the first time in history. So there's some of the significance of it. How fast do things fall? And again, knowing how fast things fall, we can see that the further away from the Earth that something is, the less the pull, the less the rate of fall. So moon, the moon is also falling, but at a decreased rate compared to like an apple. So this is something that Newton built on. So write some of those down, that's some of the significance. Because you got the earth, the apple, the moon, it's falling around the earth, but it's going so fast that it can never hit the ground. It's like a thing in some of Newton's work, he thought you showed, here's the earth, you could throw something a little bit, it goes far, you could throw it faster to go further if you throw it faster to go still further but if you throw it fast enough it'll circle around and never touch the ground my screen went dark put in my passcode hold on there we go okay um so that's the most significance of that so like we say the things galileo did why they're important and how Aristotle influenced them. And again, that'll be important. It's, under, it's important to learn how to do this to understand English, biology, economics, whatever profession you do. And this will come up in helping you um, do your IA. Okay, so there. Peace.